The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the 14th chapter. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Well, once again, good morning. Oh, I forgot to record. You know, it, you wouldn't think it'd be that hard to remember to hit the record button, and I would give Ernie so much grief every week of like, oh, you didn't record. I have forgotten like every time I'm up here. Ugh. God surely does have a sense of humor. Before I get started in the sermon, I have to say something because it dawned on me last night that I was going to be cantering today. I don't know, but I grew up in the Lutheran church, and so I was the kid in the pew that as the pastor sang all the stuff, I was also mouthing it to myself in the pew, and then like the dad kind of reaches over and like, knocks you on the head because you're not supposed to say that part. You know how good it feels to go up there and actually say the setting I grew up with was setting three and be like, oh, Lord, like I was allowed to do that. That was vindication in its most glorious way. I loved every moment of that. That was a bucket list item. I'm sure I'll do it again, something about seminary, but I don't know, maybe not. Well, if I missed you at the beginning of our service, uh, I'm Aaron Colwick, your youth minister here at Rejoice Lutheran Church. It is my absolute pleasure to be with you this morning. It is once again that time of year where most of America will be watching the highest viewed TV program of the year. It is Super Bowl Sunday. I would be remiss to not mention it. Uh, thank you to everyone who's donated cans in the back. Um, it is the Chiefs by a landslide, hopefully a predictor of the game tonight. <clears throat> so I got curious. I'm still in trivia night mode a little bit. Um, and so I got curious about it is the highest rated TV event of the year, consistently, every year. So I, I've been looking at facts and figures and little known things all month of January, so it's still part of that. Um, but bear with me here. Out of the top 10 most viewed television broadcasts in American history, eight of them are Super Bowls. Does anybody have a guess of what the other two are? Everyone says MASH. MASH is in the top 30, but not the top 10. I know, I would have thought MASH. Number one, number one is the moon landing, Apollo 11, right? It is by, I think it's like 115 million or something like that. It's, it, it's not by a lot actually anymore, but it is the most viewed. Number 10 is the resignation of Richard Nixon. And so it is what it is. In fact, out of the top 30 most viewed television broadcasts in American history, 22 of them are Super Bowls. It's insane. And, and in fact, one of them is the Super Bowl halftime show of Super Bowl 27 when they brought Michael Jackson on. The halftime show eclipsed the Super Bowl, by the way, which is insane. And that changed halftime shows forever, right? Uh, it would never be the same. Needless to say, whether you care about football or not, whether you watch a single minute of it, you probably know what the Super Bowl is. Um, I loved watching the Super Bowl as a kid. I, I still do. I love the commercials. We want, and it doesn't matter what teams are playing. I'm probably going to watch the game. Um, mainly, and it, basically, it was easy as a kid. It was the early 90s. It was a really good time to be a Dallas Cowboys fan, y'all. Um, they were always in it. It did set up some unrealistic expectations about what to expect in the Super Bowl, and so every year since 1995, kind of disappointing. <laughs> Not really good. Which brings me to our sermon topic, the five stages of grief. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. We are talking about the five stages of grief, but not because of the Cowboys. It absolutely applies to my fandom for the Cowboys, but we'll be here all year, so we're not going to get into that. <clears throat> We are going to be discussing the five stages of grief. In fact, the, this is going to be my sermon series for uh, the Lent services this year while we're doing Hold an Evening Prayer. Um, and it's not like a super fun topic. Like this isn't something that's like super enjoyable to learn and talk about. But it is really important. And I think us in particular at this time for our congregation, it's an important thing to talk about and to understand about what it means, not only for us as individuals, but what the scripture says about that. For those that don't know what I'm talking about, this is the first time you've ever heard the five stages of grief, let me kind of give you a brief summary. 
This is a model of understanding grief that was introduced by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross in her book in 1969 called On Death and Dying, um, and was inspired by her work with terminally ill patients. Now, this model was designed to help patients understand the emotions they're going through while dealing with terminal illness, which is something they can't control, right? Now, since then, it has been widely used by therapists and psychologists and clergy and CEOs and human resource workers and any number of people use the five stages of grief for anything that you're going through grief, not just about death and mortality, right? The five stages of grief are denial, which is the person dealing with the grief believes that the news that they have received is somehow false or, and that they're clinging to a false sense of reality, right? Well, surely there must be some mistake. Um, no, this isn't going to affect me. This is somebody else's problem, et cetera, et cetera, right? There's anger. The person becomes frustrated by the situation in particular, their lack of control of it. This can be taken out on other people especially, um, placing blame on others for their grief. I'm sure some of you have been the recipients of people going through that, and they kind of place the blame on you, like very, you know, unfairly, but, and we have to remember that it's not personal, right? They're just going through their experience and their journey, and that's hard to do sometimes. There's bargaining. Uh, the person tries to negotiate their way out of their grief, right? Uh, however improbable or unrealistic that may be. As people of faith, we see that a lot with prayer, right? Um, Someone gets a diagnosis of lung cancer. God, if you would take this lung cancer away from me, I promise I'll never smoke again. Or God, if you let me pass this test, I swear I'll study next time, I promise. All that kind of stuff, right? You hear a lot of bargaining and prayer. Depression or sadness, the person becomes despaired at the situation they're in. Um, becomes more lethargic in their attitude towards grief. You, see, you do see a lot of this with like terminal illness kind of things, right? Well, I'm going to die, so what's the point, right? Or you even see this a lot with um, people who are, like, elderly, and they, you know, hurt themselves. People don't die of a broken hip, but they die of a broken hip because the path of recovery is so long and arduous that it seems, is it worth it? And you see a lot of that happen. And then finally, we have acceptance, which is where we want to be with our grief, right? It's not that we, the grief is gone. It's that we've embraced the reality of the situation and the lack of control in it, and we try to understand how to live with the grief. And that's important. Now, I am married to a therapist, so I would be remiss to not explain and clarify a few things, otherwise my wife will kill me. Um, she'll be very disappointed with me. This is not an order of operations, okay? This is something that, this is not something that you're gonna go through each of these in order. You can go through these emotions in any order. You can go through them multiple times. You might not experience some of these. And so it can be that you start with anger, then denial, then bargaining, then denial, then bargaining, then denial, to acceptance, back to denial. You know, it, it, there's no right or wrong way to go through grief. It's just, it is what it is. And that's the whole point of this model is to help you understand where you might be in your grief, in an effort to help you to get to a point of acceptance where you can live with that and understand how to live your life. And again, this doesn't just apply to death, right? As an example, uh, in the latter years of Kubler-Ross's life, uh, she suffered a stroke, and so she started working with a man named David Kessler who would work with her and understand the model and actually help her publish a couple of works posthumously. And so he understood the model very well. And in 2020, he actually applied it to the world going through COVID-19, which is a very interesting like, thought experiment of that is something, it doesn't matter how old we are, from the youngest of us in here to the oldest of us, we went through that pandemic. We understand what that was like from different perspectives. And so what he said was, and I'm going to quote here, quote, there's denial, which we saw a lot of early on. This virus won't affect us. There's anger, you're making me stay home and taking away my activities. There's bargaining, okay, if I social distance for two weeks, everything will be better, right? There's sadness, I don't know when this will end. And finally, there's acceptance, this is happening. I have to figure out how to proceed and live my life, right? And regardless of where you stand in the pandemic, those things ring true for us as a society. People are still in some of these stages. You can see it in our gospel reading today how even Jesus goes through a stage of grief, but with a caveat at the end that I want us to pay attention to. In Mark 14, and going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. 
He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Jesus even bargains with God. He does what we all do, and he prays, please, I don't want to die. I really don't want to go through with this. This sounds bad, and it sound, it's not what I want. I don't want to be betrayed by my friends. I don't want to leave this earthly plane, but I understand that you're in control, not me, and this is something that needs to happen. So if it's got to happen, it's got to happen. But he still goes through that grief. So now that we understand that, and we understand the five stages of grief, at least on a superficial level, why? Why, why are we talking about it as a congregation? Why a sermon on it? Why a sermon series? Well, there's two big reasons I want us to focus on it. Firstly, our congregation is going through some grief right now. Now, some of us might be going through more grief than others, but losing your leader is not easy. I don't care what part of an organization you are, losing your leader, and for a church, losing your senior pastor is hard. And that might sound dramatic, but I'm going to be so bold to say that for most of us, it's a big loss, right? It's not like, it's not so bad of like, he's not gone from our lives. Pastor Ernie is still 20 minutes that way, right? But he's gone as our senior pastor. That's a reality. And so for the next several months, maybe a year, maybe a year and a half, who knows, we're going to be constantly reminded of that as we begin our search for our next leader. By naming that grief, by admitting to ourselves that we are in a time of loss, we can begin to heal. And that's really important, and I want you all to remember that, because we are, as we're healing, as we're going through this process, it is also a time that we're praying to God, and we're asking for discernment and guidance, and understanding of what kind of leader do we want at our church. This congregation is not the same as it was ten and a half years ago when Ernie started. It wasn't the same when he started than it was ten years before that. It will not be the same ten years from now with whoever is leading this church then. And I, can all, without, I can't predict the future. I can almost guarantee that that's going to be true. That's the point. Because at least by my observation, I've been here, this will be six years in May, which blows my mind. Um, this congregation has done pretty well at trying to adapt and trying to grow and lean in with the passage of time, which is not, I have to tell you, the norm for congregations. That's a really hard thing to do. Because what can happen is when people or organizations or congregations get to a point where we aren't in control anymore, the brain panics. If, if any of you have gone through grief or gone through trauma, you can understand where your brain all of a sudden wants to go to what it knows is comfortable. And so it wants to go to old habits or it wants to go to the way things used to be. Are we not going to grow? We're not going to change because that seems nervous and I'm going through enough right now and we want to be comfortable. But by navigating our journey of grief to a point of acceptance, we accept that God is in control, not us. This is a church. This is not Ernie's church. This is not your church. This is not my church. This is God's church. And that's the biggest struggle with grief and us understanding is that lack of control. But by scripture teaches us that ultimately that when we let God guide us, as we were told in that scripture from James, we are better for it. Which brings me to my second point of why we are going to be learning about grief this Lenten season. We have grief in our lives. I made me to click that yet. You didn't see that. We have grief in our lives in some form or fashion. And while we can be empathetic to what someone is going through, everyone's grief and everyone's journey through that grief is different. Um, all, I am a grandparent orphan, if that makes sense. Like, all of my grandparents have passed away. My, both of my grandfathers passed away, uh, one before I was born and one, I think, when I was one. So I didn't really have a relationship with them. But I had my grandmothers, and I had a great relationship with them. And they've passed on and have been so for many years. Um, has anybody else here lost their grandmothers? Just raise your hand. There's a lot of us, right? I can guarantee you none of us have the same journey in that regard. All of us have that similar stat, right? We all lost a grandparent. But our relationship with them, how we talk to them, how they talk to us, how often we saw them, 
what we did with them, social and economic standings. There are so many factors that come into play that make each and every single person's grief in this room unique. The same thing happened, but it was different. So as we navigate our way through our grief, how do we figure out how to do that? How do we know how to go on this journey if it's so different and unique for each person? We have scripture, and scripture is going to be vital for when we're going through this. Now we can look. Denial. Joshua 1.9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Anger. Whoever is patient has great understanding, but one who is quick-tempered displays folly. Proverbs 14.29. Bargaining. Let each of you speak truth with your neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger. Another anger verse. And do not make room for the devil. Depression or sadness. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. And then acceptance. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And Jesus' last words of the Great Commission, y'all, something to remember. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Guys, grief is a large subject. It is huge, and it's so hard. And there's a lot there to unpack. And I'm not suggesting it can be easier if you just pray hard enough, or that if you just give it all to God and forget about it and don't think about it, that's going to go away. That, that's not how that works. I really wish it did, because that'd be a lot easier. Rather, what we're going to be doing during our Lenten journey is looking at Scripture each week and talking about how each stage of grief can be correlated to what is the living Word of God, very applicable to our lives today, and how God is always there for us through each and every moment of our lives, the good and especially the bad. By being present in our everyday lives, by asking God to guide us in our journey, by allowing that Holy Spirit to infiltrate the very being of yourself, we can hopefully get to a point where we live with our grief, using it to grow as individuals, but also as a congregation during this time of transition. So I hope that you'll join me on Wednesdays during Lent, whether in person or streaming, to talk about that. And even if you don't, that's okay. I'm not going to hound you. God is always with you. I'm always going to pray for you. I'm always going to love you. You can't stop me. <laughs> and I'm going to pray that you navigate this journey well along with this congregation. Let's pray together, y'all. God, there are fewer things harder in this life than when we are swallowed by our grief. The world we live in is filled with brokenness and sorrow, and our hearts and minds can be pushed and pulled by the waves of grief and all the emotions that go through with that. Help us to remember that you are always with us through every valley, through every trauma, in every journey to the end of the age. As we approach our Lenten season and are reminded on Ash Wednesday of our fragile mortality, allow us to be washed with your spirit and provide us with a sense of calm. It's in your gracious name we pray. Amen.